When you press someone's hand, you want to grab this thumb should be locked. You see that? And you grab a hand, hold it. And no, no shaking. You press that. You can feel the energy of that. Now watch, I'm going to turn my hand. You see that? That way, it's locked. That way, it's locked. So if I'm falling, yes, she got me. If she's falling, no matter how, I, I got her. Islam, because this is a firm hand grip. This is an Islamic grip. No. Islam. It's an Islamic grip. Not a shake. We press. We press. We're not shaking off anything. We have no understanding. And the path of wisdom, he told, that the folly and shame and disappointment are the reward of his labor. But the wise man cultivates his mind with knowledge. The improvement of the arts is his delight and to hear the tilting to the public crown of honor. Nevertheless, there's the part of wisdom to hear with pertinence. Their impertinence, their security, and foes. I missed the last part. Impertinence, their security. Oh, can't get it, but that's all right. It's long. Um, um, and that chapter is really important to me. When I first um, started teaching in more science, uh, my uncle, who was an imam, that a family imam means minister in the Arabic language. Um, and that was one of the chapters of teaching that he made sure that we got that when you go and give a lecture or talk to anyone, because everyone has their portions of understanding, so there's no disrespect. Um, so I like to open up with that as well. And usually I can uh, get all of it, but today it's all right. I was good as um, I wanted to talk today to you all about um, birth rights, nationality and birth rights. And then I know you all want to talk about the notice too, so we want to get that in there today, all right? Um, the first thing, the um, interesting thing about us is that when we talk to a nation of people and we um, have um, the moist literature, did you bring that defense minister with you today? Uh, the moist literature? I bought some. <coughs> those books right there. All right, no, we don't have the moist literature. Do you have one? All right, let me have that. The one thing about nationality and birth rights is that if you look when everyone's talking about people, you'll hear them say the Puerto Rican, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Italians, Arabians, Puerto Ricans, Haitians, Hindustan, real Indians, not fake Indians that were not here. And then when they get to us, they say good old black or Negro or colored or African American. Now, why are we the only one with all the definitions? It's an interesting thing that we are because we have no self-knowledge. And so every 15 to 20 years, if you keep generationally, they change who we are. And they get someone to help you believe that you are this. No person can continue to change because no one can change the decent nature unless their powers extend beyond the great universal creator, Allah himself. And so how can one people be all of these things? If you are born in a household and you pull out birth certificates for those who have them, and you look at your parents and you look at your brother or sister, at that particular time, we were black. Uh, by the time I got to high school, we were Afro-Americans. And if you called a man black, he'd be ready, ready to cut your throat. But Sarah opened up my eyes to something. One day, I was really responsible for my brothers and sisters to get them to school one time every day because my mother was a single parent and she worked hard. And what I did is I got us up every day. And me and Sarah worked to small school together. And we got everybody together, her brothers and sisters, mine, and we all walked to school together. And when we got to school, the school was closed. So I don't remember getting a notice about the school being closed that day. And we the only ones in the schoolyard. And Sarah said, why is the school closed? I said, I have no idea. She said, it's probably one of those Jewish holidays. Every time they have a holiday, they close. But I'm in Puerto Rican. I got holidays, and they don't close the school for me. Well, as you can see, she was conscious of who she was, and that triggered a light in my head that she was saying that they are the only ones they close the school for, but nothing that pertains to us. And so one of the things she liked about me, she taught me a lot about what they called us in Puerto Rico, Mora. And she knew that I was a Moor. And she knew about our history. And she talked to me about Three Kings Day and ETC, things like that. So she was a very conscious Puerto Rican. And her mother 
they never would speak to me other than in Puerto Rican. So when I was young, I, I learned what you call Spanish very early. And so this helped me identify um, with myself as a Moorish American. And knowing I had a nationality, and it felt good because I had a friend who also had a nationality. So she was Puerto Rican, I was Moorish. But when it came to be explaining to people that, they would say, well, no, she's from Puerto Rico, but you from here, so that makes you black. What does that mean? And so the challenge is um, get in any international map and find Negro, black, and colored on there anywhere for me. Any international map and the things that they identify you as, find that on a map for me. And people cannot. Because each and every individual on earth has a nationality. And in the Declaration of the Rights of a Child, it states in principle three that everyone is entitled to a name and a nationality. Now, why is that so important? Because the woman named Jeb, who wrote out that declaration in the year 1923, and she was a European, and by her being a woman, they wouldn't push it through. She finally got it pushed through in 1924, and you can do your research on that. And when she did it, she was mainly talking about the children over in the eastern parts of Africa and Haiti and things like that when children were coming over here, they were taking away the birthright of the child. And the child had to have something before they came here to the uniting of the States of America. And so she wanted to do something about that. So she did, and they let it linger. They didn't do anything about it to the year 19, was it 1976 when the UN decided, the UND decided that they would incorporate the Declaration of the Rights of a Child. Um, and so they took it on as a declaration, but it's been around since 1923. So we can see that people have been trying to promote to let us know that we have a nationality to birthright, but we are the ones that are asleep. And when I use the word sleep, I'm using it as an unconscious state of mind. And so that's why when we talk to people and I correct them, I say I'm not sleeping, I'm resting, because you have to understand words have power and meaning. And one thing the prophet asks us to do is when you woke up, whatever you do, do not go back to sleep. The most interesting thing is that I hear a lot of Moors or people who claim to be Moors use the word black and Negro in their conversations and also the word white. Well, if you calling me black and identifying me as black still, then you are not respecting the birthright. If a parent does not correct their child's status, you are in violation of the law. And parents don't understand that, but your child is entitled to a name and a nationality. So when I talk to parents, I ask them, what is your child's nationality? They face freeze. Because nationality is a new word to us, but not to other nations. And it was like, well, I, you know, I'm Baptist or I'm Methodist, and I didn't ask you what your religious <laughs> de denomination was, because Christianity, no matter what denomination, is still Christianity. What I asked you is, what is your child's nationality? And children are very important to me because those are the ones that hold the key to our future. And so when I was in New Jersey, um, and this was back in the 1970s, what I did was, me personally, I went around with a pad, at that time the yellow legal pads, and I went around and I knocked on the doors to parents, and I wanted them to know, did you want the Negro, Black, or whatever they had on the record of your child removed? because I was showing the Declaration of the Rights of a Child, and I would give it to them. And a lot of parents participated in that in New Jersey, so I was very popular for that in New Jersey. And so when I went in front of the school board and to the schools, the children's declarations were changed. They were Asiatics, and they were not known as Negro, Black, and Colored. And so it was really good for me that I did that back then in the 70s because it made a lot of people conscious of that. But when I first came to them, maybe like, what? They didn't know what their child, well, their child is what I am, but I don't know who I am. And so we have a problem with self-identification, and that's one of our biggest things. And we also have self-doubt. We do not believe in ourselves, and that is why uh, chapter 26 is so important, because the wise man doubted often. So being wisdom and wise, you doubt, but wait a minute now, Jesse Jackson just 10 years ago 
they pay him to tell us we was African Americans. Mm. Well, all right, African American. Mm. All right. So Jesse Jackson is pounding that, and it's a sh you can't you can't be black. You you have to have something. So all right. Then Jesse, tell me in Africa, there's over 53, 54 different nations in Africa. So what part of Africa did you come from? Because you have to denote a nationality to it. Because you can't be two continents. And that's what people don't understand. Why am I not African American? So let me help you understand that. There is no way you can be two continents. You have to have an origin of where you're born. And you have to have a nationality to go with it. And then where you are living. So if you are a Moorish American and you are born in Africa, you would be a Moorish African because you are still Moors. So the problem with Obadiah, he put it very simple back in the day. He said, if you take an apple seed and put it in a watermelon plant, you're still going to get a what? An apple seed. So you can't keep changing us back and forth. So everybody went to African American, but guess what? They never let go of black. If you look at any application, it was Afro back and African American slash black. They even started adding the Africans from East Africa into those terms. So one interesting thing happened with this census that everybody missed, and I put on to it. Every radio station obviously was paid to say the same thing. So when the census came around again, we know that the census is every 10 years, they come around again, and they were saying, well, the word colored was on the census, colored on the census. And then they were giving excuses like, well, the older people are more comfortable with the word color. So they decided to add that on there to improve the census. Most of the older people are dead by the time this new census came around. So how is it that the older people were more comfortable when after the last 10 years, we had African American or whatever else on there, and they were comfortable with that. So now that you worried about them being more comfortable with color, this European psychology is a trick. And he's a trickster. And we get caught up in the trick. And a lot of us get paid to mislead the people. So it's not about P-R-O-F-I-T, Morris. It's about P-O-R-P-R-O-P-H-E-T. A lot of people get paid to sell out the movement. Because they don't want you to have a leader in society. They don't want you to wake up because that means their demise. I'll give you an idea of your pain. Young European with no problem. Finally, Roland Martin says, well, just to let you know, it wouldn't be no York if it wasn't for Africa. He don't usually talk like that, you know, that knowledge that he got, that he hid up underneath that ring he got on his finger. You feel me? But this European got under his skin. So when they get under our skin, then we want to start talking, you know. But he said, well, if it wasn't for Africa, you know, it wouldn't be no Europe, you know. And so he said, well, that might be true. But he said, the bottom line is we just want an all-white America. So y'all can do whatever y'all want to. He said, I think that it's awful that, you know, that the policy enforcers are killing off, you know, young, he used the word B, y'all say, the black Americans. I think it's awful. I think it's a terrible thing. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I just say that we want an all-white America. So separation, like brother... El Malik used to talk about the separation of nations. They want what we want. Martin Luther King was our nightmare. I got respect for the brother, but that, that, that integration messed us up real bad. And so what we did is we forgot about the stores that we built, the communities that we built, all down south, the bankers. I don't know how many of you are remember those seven brothers that had the banks that were down south. And everybody went bankrupt and lost it because you know why? We wanted to shop in the European shops. We wanted to buy their clothes. We wanted to eat where they eat. We wanted to sit where they sit. And guess what happened after that? We got all these kind of diseases that started popping up. We have AIDS popping up every, I mean, AIDS was starting to pop rampantly. You know, I mean, all kinds of flus. They got this strain, that strain. You know what I mean? So we, it's a dis-ease, dis-ease is a dis-ease of the mind. And the mind is what controls that. So when the prophet said we do not amalgamate or marry, people get upset about that. 
But the word amalgamate means to socialize with. And so when people say, oh, I can't help it if I fall in love with a white man or a Caucasian or European or LBI or whatever they want to call them, I can't help that. Yes, you can. Because in your very surroundings, you control your feelings. So if you are not amalgamating with other than your own people, then you won't be strained that way. Because that's how we lost our birthright in the first place. So why would you want to go back in, in that direction? So it's a lot of excuses that we make for ourselves, and we need to stop making those excuses. I want to say a little bit of what Prophet Noble Drali said, because this wraps it up, and I know a lot of you all probably have heard me read this over and over again. But it's one of the most important things that Prophet Noble told us about ourselves, and also to know, let us know who we are. So, so bear with me. It says the divine one and by the prophet for the nation. And I just want to stop there for a minute, the word divine. How many can tell me what the word divine means? Ordained. Ordained. What else? Exceptional. Holy. Holy. Right? The word divine. Anybody got black law dictionary? Y'all know y'all could come with pen paper? Let's look up the word divine. Oh, unabridged, anybody got unabridged dictionary? Old dictionary, new American heritage dictionary? Oh, y'all know this is a class that got to come from the with paper, pen, and... Divine warning. Divine warning. It's a law. It's a law, but it's, uh, when it says divine, the first key word is divine. And that's what I want to address today, divine. Because the prophet didn't just say it was a warning. He said it was a divine warning. And so the key first word is divine. Find it in there. Anybody else got another dictionary? All right. Could you stand for me, brother, and state your name and read divine for me, please? Islam. 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 As distinguished from those of human origin, divine laws are those of which authorship is ascribed to God being either positive or revealed laws or the laws of nature. Islam. Islamism. The laws of nature. Divine warning by the Holy Prophet for the nations. I want to stop there for a minute. Nation. <laughs> you got a whole lot of Moors running around here talking about Prophet Noah Jolly didn't talk about no nation and he didn't talk about no nationality. I think that said a divine warning for the what? Nations. The nations. That means that you must be a nation. Exactly. Who can tell me the definition of the word nation? Nation. I've said it lots of times, Brother Shahid. United. Stand for me. Tell me your name and stand for me. Shahid L. Uh, nation is uh, united. Being united. All right, but what else with the being united? What does it come with? What do you need to be united? People. People. It's on. United people. Anybody else? Come on, y'all. Talk to me now. <coughs> Nation. A group of people sharing the same customs, <laughs> beliefs, religion, ideals, and language and culture. Right? That means that we are a nation. Whether you are conscious or unconscious, it is your birth. Right, Islam. I like my brother because he's using his phone to get his definition. That's what I'm talking about. And it's an electrified age. It says, a people or aggression of men existing in the form of an organized general social society, inhabiting a distinct portion of the earth, speaking the same language, using the same customs, possessing historic continuity, and distinguished from other like groups by their racial origin and characteristics and generally, but not necessarily, living under the same government and sovereignty. Islamism. Islam. Now, sovereignty is in that definition, right? Right now, they talk about sovereign citizens as dangerous, right? They call around talking about sovereign citizens are, are, are protesting against government. they anti-government. The word sovereign itself is not a harmful word. It's what they... You got to remember the European labels things for his benefit. See, for you to be sovereign, which means to be free, to have the freedom of choice, and if you have that, then he can't control you. 
He wants to keep you under his jurisdiction. But even though we are more nationals and we don't practice the sovereignty part, that part that we practice, we practice the national side of our movement because we have a national and divine movement. It's not, but our nation is sovereign, which means that we are free. We're separated from the other nations. Nations talk to nations. Nations go to other nations and trade and transportation and discuss political things. That's a nation. So when you look at other nations of people, does it make you question, when you see Puerto Ricans, you see a whole lot of them together at one time, right? They eat together, they talk together. You buy the one, you buy them all, they want, they'll attack you. When I was coming up here, the same um, bleeding people were like Chinese. I saw them uh, doing the flight and in the hotel, when they came down to eat, all of them came down to eat. And they all made sure everybody was fine before they went. Did you have enough looking out for each other? That's the nature of people. What's wrong with us? As long as I ate, I don't care if she over us. That's the one her. She shouldn't have stayed up late. That's the kind of stuff we say. How about maybe the sister stayed up late because she wanted to talk or she just needed to study? Whatever her reason was, does that mean that she don't deserve to eat? Am I my brother's keeper? I wanted to hear you say, yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> am I my sister's keeper? Yes I, yes, I am. So as long as we keep each other, and you can look up the word keep, because word etymology, keeping, that means that we got each other's back. So when some wars today that, that know how to properly press, I was born into the demonstration of that, because when a hand presses a grip, you hold on to me. Both sides, those thumbs lock. You have to look at the picture that the prophet has. Those thumbs lock. So that means if you lean backwards, I got you. So you're not going to fall. If I'm leaning backwards, you have me, I'm not going to fall. So we're going to hold each other up. It's not always. It's not we're going to demonstrate a little about that today because it's real important how you greet one another as Moors. We have to be very careful about how we greet one another. And those are things that we have to learn because right now we have what we call learned behavior. And we have to get rid of that. We take off, and think about this. Learning and being conscious. Prophet Noble Drowley, he said, this is very, when I was coming up, very important to me. He said that, you know, um, he'd like to see a conversation between a conscious Asiatic and an unconscious Asiatic. He said, you can be talking, you know, giving this information out. He said, but then when they start acting, he said, your spirit is not going to jump on them. But their spirit will jump on you. The next thing you know, you acting like them. That's learned behavior. Islam. It's something about, when do we start calling our children kids? Islam. Islam. That's what I'm talking about, learned behavior. Islam. When did we start raising goats? Islam. Baby goats in our houses. <laughs> and so when your children run around acting like that and tearing things up, you want to know what's wrong with their behavior. You put that on now. Because goats ravish everything. Islam. They're destructive little beasts. When we start having goats for children, I looked at good times and I wanted to go back and see how far in my research, because that's what I do, I'm a researcher, and trust me, for those, you learn to research and that's how we learn. And I said, wow, all the way back in the 70s, they used good times to give us the kids, they used good times to give us the blonde-haired, blue-eyed man, that crook, the thief that they tried to call Jesus. So they tried to put those subliminal thoughts in your mind. You know, and this is on Good Times, and all of us watch Good Times, I mean, in my age area coming up, and they still do the reruns, you know. And then you look at it and see how simple that a lot of that stuff was. But this is learned behavior.